Okay, so this goes down your patient assessment, medical patient assessment skill sheet. Like my son Zach told me uh, over the weekend, we I could actually teach this off the skill sheet. I don't need the, the slides or anything. You just sort of go down the skill sheet and talk about each line, and that would cover this chapter. If you look in the book, it goes straight down the essentially straight down the skill sheet. Okay. Uh, we don't want you guys to be perfect at patient assessment, but we want you to get systematic and be able to do uh, the skill sheet. The Horn students are already, you should be already really familiar with the patient assessment, right? So we look at it, we beat the sides up uh, like a dead horse. So we, we won't really talk about that, but that's the first thing, BSI, you know, make sure the scene is safe, make sure that you have a a good size up, right? We talked about that all, all last time. So going down the skill sheet, take the precautions, evaluate the hazards, right? Nature of illness or is it an injury, number of patients, do you need additional resources, right? And so once you get finished with that, then you get into your primary assessment. Now take note of this because this is, you see this like on a test question, primary assessment, that means the ABCs, right? I say, I used the old term ABCs, but they used primary assessment. So what is the problem? Is there any life threats that's, that is there, immediate life threats that you're gonna to have to take care of? And is this patient a rapid transport? Or can you sit a little bit? Or do you need to, what we call load and go, and load and go, right? On the rap, rapid transport. So when you look at your primary assessment, you, you look at this and you form a good general first impression of the patient. All right, we're, we're, there's a few pictures coming up, so we'll talk about that in a minute. ABCs, remember ABCs in a conscious patient, CAB in an unconscious patient. That is very important when, especially on a test question. Uh, the patient's unconscious, you would do CAB, as the American Heart Association wants you to do. And then ABCs on the uh, conscious patient. Check level of consciousness, add to, right? And uh, determine if they're conscious and they're alert, then A no times four, person, place, time, and event, to see at what level the level of consciousness is. And then use the add to, like if they are re responsive to verbal, painful stimulus, unresponsive, right? and then always look at the priority of the patient. Uh, anytime that there's a life threat, then it would make sure that you do rapid transport. Uh, when you skills test, always just say, I'm gonna rapid transport the patient. That way you take care of both trauma and medical. Just say, we're gonna rapid transport the patient. And you get your point and then you can move on, okay? There's a graph that I can't see and you can't, but it's sort of a flow chart. It's in your book, so you can look at it. it sort of gives you a flow chart. Uh, I think it's too complicated on this one. So we'll, and we'll go over that in lab here in, in a little bit. So we look at the general, get this general first impression, determine the chief complaint. Remember that is a abbreviated C over C. Chief complaint, the chief complaint is what the patient tell you. So you get out there and you determine the chief complaint. Uh, if they're conscious, then my big toe hurts. So you would put that in quotes, what the chief complaint in your documentation, you would put that in quotes. Right? And then everything else that follows, my big toe hurts and so does my little toe. Or my heel hurts. Right? If you put it in some a different emergency. I have chest pain, so that would be the patient's chief complaint. The patient states he has chest pain, and the patient's complaining of nausea, vomiting, right, shortness of breath. So this would be complaining of, would follow that. About every sense that you have, you know, touch, feel, you're going to use in patient assessment, probably except taste, right? You know, you got that diabetic patient, you want to lick their urine and see if it has ketones in it. Screw it up. Right? Take a little sip, 
Mm, that's sweet. Mm. Are you diabetic? So, taste is out the window, right? No taste. Everything else you probably use. Observe the environment. Look at that. Uh, is it messy? Are there medications around? Is there a needle? Needles out, right? Uh, it gives you pick up clues. Smell. You know. Do you smell ketones like in that PCA patient, right? Do you smell the ketones, uh, other smells like a GI blue? You never forget it, right? So the, the, mm, that's, that smells like a GI bleed. So sight, uh, touch, as far as when you start your physical assessment. I'm horrible at estimating age, but uh, if the patient's conscious, just ask them, you know, how old are you, you know? And then the gender is only important in, in some cases, but is it a medical or trauma? Is it both? Do they have a chest pain, got dizzy and fell down the stairs? Right, so you could have both. You have to be cautious of that. Get the chief complaint, and then again, life threats. Right. So this, this lady here, we're getting this general first impression. What's your first impression? She's pale. Is she? She looks pale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That doesn't seem pale, like she's not sweating profusely. You get all that from a picture? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yes, she's conscious. She, she has. To me, she has sort of a look of why. What do you want? You know. But uh, I'm not. I'm not really good at picking up those facial expressions, uh, like most people. I don't. I don't really pick those up. But uh, anyway, you, you form. Is this a serious? Is this some sort of injury or is it an illness? And then the more that you talk with them. But this is over time that you uh, you look at uh, general first impression. What about this guy? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I didn't see that. The little inhaler, very good. I didn't even want to see that. Or emphysema, or he has a respiratory thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so he, he has the inhaler there. This is a tripod position, remember that? He's sort of okay. tripoded out. So that's an obvious sign of respiratory distress. And then, see the way his lips are pursed, sort of pushed out? Uh, another sign. And uh, respiratory problems are fairly easy to see. You can tell right away if they're in respiratory distress. Uh-oh. <coughs> okay. He shouldn't have drank so much at lunch. But bleeding, control the bleeding. Bleeding is part of C and circulation. So make sure, you know, that when you look at your skill sheet, you're going to check. Does C have any major bleeding? Yes or no? You know? uh, and we'll, we'll go down through the skill sheet in a little bit when we look at that. Right? Uh, what about this? Looks unconscious. Almost looks like he's in a recovery position for you. You know, <laughs> nice to fall in that. What about medical or trauma? Well, you don't know for sure. Right. So you got to be aware that they don't. They didn't see the guy fall out of bed. They didn't see him. They just found him in the floor. So you should. And he's unconscious. So you can't. You can't. You can't get any sort of evaluation. So you would have to sort of treat him like a trauma patient, right? Just an unknown fall. So we have to make sure that we look at that. And then on the skill sheet uh, as well, do, do I need, is there a need to hold C-spine? Is there a need for spinal immobilization or spinal restrictions, okay? And do they need to be placed on the backboard? If you're looking at your skill sheet, we're, I mean, we're going straight down the skill sheet as far as, uh, all this is looking at. Okay. Compressions, oxygen, uh, like the, the BVM and then like the oxygen tank. I think those are the only three skills that you should really have. No, you should 
I'll get you one if you don't. No, I don't. I don't remember getting it. Yeah. We got it. I get you. Okay. All right. So sometimes it is difficult to say, "Hey, is this a trauma? Or this is a medical." Uh, always rule on the side of caution. Go trauma, right? You don't want to get. Uh, you don't want to say, "Oh, this is medical," and all of a sudden they were in this big traumatic fall, and they have a lot of problems. It's always easier to rule on the side of caution when we look at that. Other things, sight, it's another sense that you use, right? You're seeing this, like you saw the inhaler, right? What's What about this patient? What kind of history does he have? Yeah, he's part of the zipper club. You can see through right here. Uh, it looks, if you get close, it looks like a little zipper. That's why they get that, that tag. They're part of, they've had open heart surgery. So you know right away, this patient has probably had open heart, or they've had major surgery, right? and then if they're conscious, you can ask them, did you have open heart surgery, or what, what kind of surgery did you have? If it was an abdominal scar, right? A scar on the knee. What, what kind of scar is that? You know, go into the knife. So, uh, you know, you, you start putting the pieces of pie together, right? and just like we said, determine if they're injured or ill, is this a trauma, or is this a uh, medical, and the, you, you look for different clues, and you ask the patient, and then like this guy, he's he's bleeding, right? So it's it's some form of trauma, uh, but that could be caused by a medical condition as well. But we treat on the, on the trauma side. Then we'll, next class we'll get the trauma assessment. What about this guy? What what can you form up? Well, one thing. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's in a home, like a, like a, like a nursing home. Okay, nursing home, yeah. He does look sick. What else? He, he might be suffering from the fever. I mean, like his, his face is all red. I would assume he could be suffering from the fever. Okay, red, what? So something like that, you're really flushed. So that that is well, so that's good. So we look at this and we go, okay, what? This really helps when you form that general impression. Uh, it, it leads you down to your assessment questions. And obviously their chief complaint is going to guide you in your questions, right? But you do want to form up a, this general good uh, impression. Like we said, this is, uh, this is what the patient says. You put this in quotes and documentation. We don't really assume anything, so we're good there. We try not to assume, and then uh, once we get their chief complaint, then our line of questions is based on their chief complaint. I'll give you some questions, uh, Horn students. You got you had these from last year, somewhere, but the, the questions that you'd want to ask, all right, sort of get get you going in that direction. Then then you start. Okay, you form up this general. Uh, Impression, but is there something major wrong that requires immediate treatment? Do they have compromised airway? Do they have dry vomit on their uh, their face? Secretions, a lot of secretions, blocking, open wounds. This paradoxical movement uh, we'll learn about later, as far as a flail chest. Did we watch that video last year with the flail mm -hmm. chest? I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, we didn't get very far. Okay. Major bleeding. Is it or? Venous arterial, are they unresponsive? Are they breathing and they're not breathing? Are they agonal respirations? Do you need to, you need to start breathing for them? A lot. Do they have a pulse? That's C, but all right. So this is all the stuff that, that good general impression. Do you need the AED? You know, are they in cardiac arrest? Begin compressions, right? CAB. If they don't have a pulse in cardiac arrest, you immediately start doing compressions. Airway, how do you open the airway in an atraumatic patient? Head tilt, chin lift. Head tilt, chin lift, right? Ventilate them, apply the AED. Uh, uh, if you suspect trauma, 
make sure that you hold the seat spine. And then uh, you can, if you're ventilating them, remember the picture in the book, you can try to hold the seat spine. If there's just two, you can hold the seat spine with your, your legs and still ventilate the patient. More than likely, there's going to be more than two. So you have extra hands. So just a picture on uh, spinal mobilization. You guys know all about that. And yeah, don't don't move your head. Try to get the patient not to move their head. If you need them, if you're doing a spinal mobilization, make sure you use the log roll technique where someone's holding C spine and you uh, log roll the patient up on their side, especially if they start vomiting. They need to be log rolled on the side, suction. And then we're down to check the mental status on the ab tree, right? We talked about this last time. Uh, alert, verbal, painful, unresponsive. So, uh, are they eight on times four, three, you know, put in place time and event? You sort of get that definition uh, down on how responsive they are. Later, when we when we get sort of down towards the end, we'll talk about the Glasgow Coma Scale, where you actually attach a number at, as as far as the baseline is concerned. And then there's what the attitude means. We went through this, right? Did we? Okay. Some time ago. If they're unresponsive and they're posturing, I believe we talked about this last year. Oh, yeah. Is it that then most likely they're dead? Well, they're, they have a brainstem type injury, yeah. So they could be here and have shallow breathing, inadequate respirations, right? I mean, they're not, if they're posturing, they're really approaching the light, <laughs> okay? Uh, this is usually a, a sign of brainstem herniation, but this is the corticate posturing, just a uh, picture of it, and the way that I remember it is the corticate carrying a, a wood, a cord of wood, which is a measurement of wood, and then so you carry wood like this, so it's drawing the hand <coughs> into you. I don't know if that helps, but it just makes the corticate posturing is where the hands are drawn in, okay? And uh, definitely a sign of a, a brain stem injury, okay? And then the cerebrate posturing uh, where they're, they're actually fanning out, the hands are fanning out. I think this is a little much. I've, I've seen both and uh, the ones that I've seen the cerebrate posturing in, that they just, they're, they're out like this. They're laying in bed like this. Their, their hands are out to the side uh, and, and like that. And their feet are, are down. Deep brain injury. Each one has a different level of injury, but it's not important really at this level for you to know that. Just know that the the corticate and the cerebrate posturing is a, uh, a brain injury. Okay, so it's determine the airway status. Is it open? Is it closed? Do they have some sort of compromise, like a strider, like a partially obstructed airway? Do they only speak in one or two word sentences, you know, where it's really showing Respiratory distress, are they sort of gasping, not speaking, could be a full body airway obstruction. You have to get the patient to, to speak to you. Uh, I've had patients, they wouldn't talk to me. And uh, you could just tell they were being stubborn, but uh, kept telling them, just, you have to speak to me. I have to hear you speak. You know, And when they did speak, it wasn't nice. So I just don't repeat that. But anyway, or do they have really bad altered mental status and it's the air, airway compromise some way? You know, if they're complete, they're semi-unconscious or they're completely unconscious, do they have a gag reflex? That if, if they don't have a gag reflex and they're unresponsive, then their airway is completely compromised. They don't have any control over their airway. Anyway, head tilt chin lift, a medical patient. We 
know about that, check your CPR. And uh, what else do we have to do? So in the airway, when we're talking about airway, you know, we may have to do a head tilt chin lift, we may have to put an OPA in, right, an NPA uh, position. Maybe they, they just need their head positioned up. They need to lift their head up to get the airway open. Maybe the tongue's partially blocking it, or maybe that you, you need to suction. They have secretions or something in there. They have to really suction. Uh, I always avoid sticking my fingers in the patient's mouth. Okay, we have tools to keep from having to do that, right? You don't want to put your fingers in the patient's mouth. Of course, fingers sweet. You might need an OPA, NPA. Now, they could have snoring respirations with the, uh, the posturing, okay, but that's just due to herniation. Uh, typically, snoring respirations, this means that the tongue is partially blocking the uh, airway. So they need an airway maneuver, OPA or MPA. Uh, a lot of elderly people, geriatric patients, they can't keep their head up and their head drops down and it blocks their airway and they start snoring. When you lift their head up, then it stops, okay? So they need an NPA. Uh, an unconscious patient may need uh, an, an OPA. Gurgling is a sound of uh, fluid. So you have vomitus, you have secretions, okay? If you listen to it, then it could be bells or ronca. Crowing sounds like the bird, right? So you have a this this sound. It's very it's more in pediatrics than anything. And then strider that high pitched sound. What with Steve here, we'll listen to the the different airway sounds, so we we'll could get a good indication on how that is. So gurgling, if the patient is gurgling, be ready to suction, right? Protect the airway, open the airway. Make sure that uh, it's not blocked. And then uh, determine whether the patient's bleeding adequately or inadequately. We'll get more into that in respiratory, but you know, do they have good tidal volume, right? Are they getting a good breath in? Are they able to get air from the inside to the out, from the outside to the inside? If not, you may have to do Keep in mind the different terms, you know, positive pressure ventilation or the bag valve mass, right? And then uh, your book goes into minute volume. Make sure that you guys know how to calculate and what minute volume is. What, what would you think minute volume would be? Yeah, the, the volume over a minute. And then if you're talking about air, then the amount of air over a minute. So if they had a tidal volume of 500, over a minute, what would that equal? 500 times what? 60, right? What would that be? What? Two zeros, three zeros, three thousand? Thirty thousand? Yeah. One zero, two zero. Okay, so 30,000 minute, minute volume. Not really that important to figure that up. You he just, gives it to the students to be aware of the time. Okay. Just to let you know, we have someone working on our PA system and our telephone system, so you may hear some beeps and dials and things like that. Um, don't be alarmed. Thank you. Were you alarmed? So anyway, uh, just know the terms, not really that important. Uh, you do want to make sure that they're getting good tidal volume over a regular period of time. Inadequate breathing, anytime you see this word inadequate breathing, then you have to, are they getting enough tidal volume? Uh, this would equal a uh, bag valve mass, right? So if they, you have a patient that has inadequate respirations, you're probably going to use positive pressure ventilation. Or if they're adequately breathing, good rate, 12 to 20, right? Good tidal volume, then they're adequately breathing. 
and then you go in or they're breathing too fast or they're breathing too slow right they're breathing too slow you may have to use the positive pressure ventilation right the bag valve mask if their rate is fast or slow I mean it, uh, you have different rates where it's really fast and it's really slow really fast and really slow and we'll get into those when we run across them in, in the respiratory chapters okay Yeah. Retractions, it's in the neck or accessory muscles, nasal clearing, retractions as they pull on their neck, trying to pull air in, tripoding, okay, pale cool, clammy skin, obviously cyanosis, cyanosis is going to be a late sign, okay, and then it's the SpO2 below 94%, asymmetrical chest wall, what's asymmetrical? It's not, it's not going Right, they're, they're doing something. One's coming out, one's going in. They're not moving. We want symmetrical rise and fall of the chest. Right? Warm, warm pink skin. No, no cyanosis. <laughs> uh, so these are key words that you're going to see uh, on the National Registry and on the test that follow. You, the patient cyanotic, or the patient has inadequate respirations. That's why the charts in your book are so important to look at. Uh, where they have, they're using accessory muscles to breathe. That might be part of the, the question, right? So you know that they're in respiratory distress. Listen, listen for any kind of abnormal breath sounds. Check breath sounds with your stethoscope. Right? Uh, obviously, if they have no chest wall movement, they might be in respiratory arrest, right? Or at least a poor tidal volume. So these are the things that you, it's easier when you're actually looking at the patient instead of, you know, over here, Frank or Steve or whatever, and then that, uh, it's much easier to get this down on the patient. So if the chest good, rise, adequate rise and fall, you hear good airway exchange, how would you know what's good airway exchange? How would you know what that sounds like? A good exchange of oxygen in the inside of that? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, what do you mean? Good tidal volume. What? How, how do you know what that sounds like? It's, you don't hear much noise. You don't hear the crackling or. No, I mean, how, how would you know? You're new at this. How would you know? <laughs> What's normal? <laughs> I mean, how would you know that? How would you know? Oh, this. Yeah, but how would you know what that sounds like? You're overthinking. There you go. You've listened to each other. You guys have adequate tidal volume. Okay, so during skills practice, you take that stethoscope and you listen to each other, okay? And that's what adequate amount of air movement sounds like, right? So when you get to the, now you guys, clinical, you, you've heard different airway sounds, right? So you know the difference, but uh, that way if you hear what's adequate, you know what's inadequate. Right? You know what, you, you train your ear for that. Apoxia. The, you know, low SpO2, they're low on oxygen, are they, are they in failure, are they in respiratory distress? And these are all things to uh, look at in, in the near future as we run through the medical emergencies. Okay. Part of the C, the circulation, the pulse, any major bleeding. If you notice on your skill sheet, the skin is also on there for uh, circulation. It, it, are they warm, pink, and dry, or are they somewhere else? And then they have capillary refill less, less than what? Hmm? Two, seconds. Two seconds, right. So check, uh, for an unconscious person, you would check a carotid pulse. For a conscious person, you would check a radial pulse. Uh, a child, you can check the brachial pulse. For an infant. If a child, you would go ahead and check a radial pulse. 
you want the first thing you want to do when you do your ABCs is make sure that's present. Uh, the presence of a radial pulse tells you that the patient at least has an, uh, a blood pressure of 80 systolic, which is going to perfuse the kidneys. Okay? I have a bug here. I've got to look at my cheat sheet. A carotid pulse tells you that the patient has a pressure at least 60, and a femoral pulse at least 70 systolic. So it's just an estimate. So if they have a carotid pulse, they have an estimated systolic pressure of 60. That's a carotid pulse without a radial. So you feel for a radial, there's no radial. You feel for a carotid, there's a presence of a carotid pulse. Then they have an estimated 60 systolic. And then 70 systolic on the femoral pulse. Uh, if they don't have a carotid, if they have a femoral, then they have an estimated 70. We talked about plus one and plus two, right? The strength of the plus three pulses, correct? Yes. Okay. And then is it regular or irregular? You want to you want to note that. If it's irregular, then you would ask the patient, is there conscious? Do you have an irregular heartbeat? They know that. Right? They know that for sure. And then get a pulse rate, obviously. Rate will tell you a lot of stuff. So look at the rate. You know, are they tachycardic or are they bradycardic? So you have to sort of start figuring out things based on the rate. But the rate, the heart rate, will change first before just about anything else. If the patient's in pain, they have a, a they might be tachycardic, or they probably will be tachycardic or increased heart rate. If they're dehydrated, they have a tachycardia, right? They have an associated heart rate. If they're going into shock, compensated shock, they will have a tachycardia. So rate is very important. But the first thing, we want to make sure it's there. And then we want to make sure that they're not bleeding to death as we continue through this, okay? So if you go there and you, you're like taking a pulse, yeah, they have a pulse, oh, but they have this big femoral bleed and they're shooting blood out all over the place, right? You can stop there and, and uh, or you can begin there. You walk up to your patient, and your first general impression is they look like old faithful. They're, I mean, just blood shooting out of their femoral artery, okay? You can start there by applying direct pressure, right? Uh, and then go back. Like I said, if we know this, characteristics of blood flow, bright red, spurting blood, it's arterial, and determine that if, there, if it's a major bleed, then we have to take care of that. That's a life threat. Got away the clothes. Uh, always expose. We'll talk about that when we get to trauma. You want to expose the patient so you don't miss any kind of injuries. It's easy to miss injuries if you don't expose the patient. Then apply a pressure dressing, direct pressure to control the bleeding. Halfway refill or scan temperature, warm, pink, and dry, right? How, how do we know what's warm? Touch yeah, touch yourself. You know, not my flat chart. Touch yourself. I got acid warm. <laughs> no, no, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Uh, you know, pra practice that. When you're practicing Bible science and stuff, practice touch, you know, Feel the skin temperature, get used to it. So there's a, I wouldn't remove my gloves, but you would, you get used to feeling through the glove on, are they cold, are they clammy, right? Uh, they, are they flushed, are they hot? Get this, the skin temperature, it tells you a lot about the patient. Like, that like you were saying before, that first lady, are they, they're pretty pale looking? So, you know, are they, are they having a cardiac event? Cyanosis, obviously a decrease in oxygen, but very late sign. Flushed, like a heat-related emergency. And then uh, jaundice, obviously they, yep, the yellow man, they have a liver, liver dysfunction. The too hot, you know, and hot to the touch, and then, or they, they just cool, but they don't. You know, they're not really warm, or they frozen. And, and cool and clammy. Uh, 
just you just have to sort of get used to you know you you have somebody that's in the clinical setting and you say man they're they're clammy go in and you know check their pulse or something so you can feel clammy skin so you get used to that and then once you do that a couple times you don't you don't really forget it but they're really dry okay uh, spinal shock a uh, neurogenic shock the patient's going to be really warm it's opposite we haven't talked about shock yet but the patient's going to be warm they're not going to be cool okay or are they moist they're, they're diaphoretic for some reason okay so this all these things lead you down different paths to start thinking about different conditions and then capillary refill like it says here it's more reliable in the infants and children Old, older people have different uh, you know vessel constriction and poor circulation where it's not as good remember the uh, fingernail polish don't do a capillary refill with the, the fingernail polish but you can do a capillary refill almost anywhere if if you have any doubt about delayed capillary refill just come over here and push on buzz's knee i'm it, doing it i'm going it, here to well yeah like that, that. that's a good picture delayed capillary refill she probably has a big clot in her leg or something no just, don't want to jinx her yeah, okay, no clot just a tight brace and you can loosen okay but then shock, another word for shock, hypoperfusion, shock, a life-threatening uh, event that we're, we'll talk about next week or so. Uh, and then down to skill sheet still, identify and prioritize the patient. Is this patient a, a priority transport? When you're testing your skills, the patient is always a priority transport. Just say it get it out of the way so you get your point okay uh, unstable re remember vital signs unstable patients vital signs every five minutes stable patients you can take vital signs every 15 minutes okay or they unstable for some reason do they have a major bleed are they in shock uh, are they breathing three or four times per minute that would be unstable right are they breathing 50 times per minute is that for an adult that would be unstable so you have these different uh, or do they have a compromised airway that would be unstable right? so we have to determine is this patient stable or unstable and so an unstable patient this secondary assessment that we're going to do here in a few minutes is uh, it would be rapid so if you have an unstable medical patient then the secondary assessment be a rapid assessment so you go through your physical exam very fast to look for life threats all right the same way in trauma you do a rapid physical exam or secondary assessment a medical patient doesn't that you can not that you'd want to take your time but it doesn't require rapid I'll, we'll show you the difference here with Steve okay always the, the secondary assessment is so you find other injuries okay so you're not looking over injury other in in medical problems you know so you want to do, do a good physical exam so you don't overlook uh, other things baseline set of vitals always get that get that set of vital signs and you base everything on the baseline set of vitals so your treatment is based on these set of vital signs right, and a good history. Go through your sample, your OPQRST, and get a good history and uh, past medical history. Then your, your head to toe exam. All right, so you go down through. Over here I have a list, sort of what I want you to go down through. Okay? I have a video too, I'll show you a little video here at the end. Uh, we will do it systematically and we'll start head to toe but you have to understand that you work these things in so you work the sample and the OPQRST in in the physical exam as well 
So if they're having trouble breathing, you can stop for a minute and listen to breath sounds, right? You know, if they're complaining abdominal pain, you can stop and expose and then look and palpate the quadrants of the abdomen. So you sort of blend these together as you get better doing it. And then like you said, a, a final patient, unstable patient, we just do a rapid physical exam. Trauma, always expose the, what you're looking at. You want to make sure that you see, uh, you can see the injuries. And then just to uh, go through head to toe, look upper extremities. Uh, if it's a medical patient, you suspect of a stroke, the, the arm drift, right? Remember that? The, the what's it called? The fast, the, the fast. Uh, facial droop, arm drift, speech, and then time. So you would do the arm drift. I think there's a picture. Check good pulses, motor function. Can they move their extremities? Do they have good distal pulses? And can they feel you touching them? Okay. And then that's sort of the arm drift. And it will drift rather quickly. You won't have to sit there. Don't sit there for, you know, 10 minutes waiting for their arms to drift. It'll happen in just a couple of minutes. The back of the body, and palpate, look through the back, check the back, down the back, down the spinal cord. And this is a lot depending upon the uh, chief complaint. If my little toe hurts, and that's my only chief complaint, then you might just bypass checking my back, right? I mean, once, but I say that, but we want to do it in a systematic approach, okay? Here you want to check the posterior because so you can get your point on your uh, skill sheet, right? Mental status, motor, facial expression, speech. They're probably in a bad mood because they're sick, right? And do they remember, especially memory? Memory plays an important role in the head injuries, okay? Different kind of head bleeds. So when we do talk about that, you'll see, hey, you want to, you ask them a question and say, hey, remember this, remember this question for later, I'm going to ask you about it. And so you'll check uh, for memory. S smile, make sure it's symmetrical, that they don't, don't have the facial droop. You can see it coming, but hey. And then we, as we do the physical exam, we want to do it in systems. So we're going to teach you that to do it in systems. So you'll do a neurological exam, a respiratory exam, cardiac, right, abdominal, GI. So we, we learn how to do it in systems. And then as we go through, just, just the posterior. So we'll, we'll do that in lab. I'll show you how to do that. Great strength, skin, more pink dry, good capillary fill, good blood pressure, pupils, SO2, all that included, breathing rate, respiratory rate. And then your sample, we went through the sample already, but okay. So do your obtain your history through sample, both trauma and medical. Remember trauma, you may you may be asking bystanders, they may be unconscious. Same with medical, okay? For pain, the OPQRST, so use those uh, mnemonics to help you with that. And then, oh, wait. Oh, okay. The, we'll get into the, the, the trauma uh, assessment next time, okay? That was pretty quick, right? But it was it was just right off your skill sheet, correct? Mm -hmm. So you, you learn that skill sheet and you you can memorize it, okay? But it'd be better to just to learn it and use it. I mean to get past the skills exam, memorization's okay. Being a robotic memorization's good. Later we want you to learn it so you can sort of use it. And uh, once you pass the ABCs in that top part of the skill sheet, you can you can blend those 
that sample and that OPQR are continuing to be gathered. You don't have to keep those apart. Uh, okay, I'll get uh, uh, reevaluate. So reassess once you get uh, once you make your initial assessment. You do a reassessment. This is from last year uh, on the on the physical exam. And I do say to give credit, it's it was like spontaneous. It wasn't planned, so I mean it was I went and got Mallory off the cuff and we came in and did the uh, assessment. Is that person Mr. Marie? Good assessment, huh? What about any any uh, constructive criticism? What what about any, anything that you guys picked up? What about, I mean, with the assessment, what did you pick up? What you probably would have done on the presentation. Just a couple of things. I would have, I would have checked for this. It's, it's a medical patient, yeah, but it's okay. It's a medical, it's a medical uh, assessment. Uh, check for, I forgot what it's called, JVD. Oh, JVD? Yeah. Yeah. She was saying supine, so she couldn't do that. Wait, what, wait, how, Just, how, do, you, how do you do some weight in order? At order a 45 to degree angle. 45 degree. But what about, I mean, just the things that you saw in the, as the assessment, what, what were a couple things? Just, just a couple. It was really good assessment, uh, considering where we were in the class. So what, what did you see that was like, oh, you wouldn't have done that? I mean, it looked good. Yeah. It looked good, but the toenails are painted, so they couldn't do that. What, one, one other thing that I picked out right away that she probably would have done, but give, give her credit because she, at that point in time, I don't think she would have done it. What do you think? Uh, uh, Let me tell you, we might have to take a break. Yeah. She palpated the abdomen without looking, which, oh, which was okay because it would have been a little awkward in the classroom. But 
both marriage and the being great sir. Uh, uh, you, before you palpate someone's abdomen, you want to look at it. You want to make sure that there's not any masses, pulsating masses or anything there. Okay. Otherwise, good. Otherwise, good assessment. Thanks. You think that was a good, good assessment? I do too. From where we were, from where we were in the in the class, that was a very good assessment. And considering that it was like I got them all back there and didn't say anything, and went and got Mallory and brought brought her in and and did it. I mean, it was like right off the the cuff. So no no preparation time. All right.